Before we get into the video, I'm glad to see that as of recent, microplastic maxing has become more mainstream, with recent studies finding that all participants had a quote-unquote worrying amount of microplastics in their bowls. Yeah, the only thing worrying about it is that the amount of microplastics was tiny. Only a couple hundred micrograms per gram of tissue. That's nothing. Real microplastic maxers plastic max so hard that they shit out Lego pieces. If enough of us got together, we could put the Lego company out of business. In fact, I microplastic max so hard that forget microplastics in my balls. My balls are made of microplastics. I don't have a sack, it's just a plastic bag and they are in there free balling. But anyway, aside from that human experiment that all males are partaking in, what are other human experiments that you can actively partake in? Lucky for you, Stoic Stick is about to bless you with four more DIY human experiments that you shouldn't try at home. Let me stress that although in the title it does say do it yourself, for the sake of my channel's health, do not try these at home. Our first don't DIY at home human experiment is changing the bacteria in your mouth to produce alcohol instead of lactic acid so that you don't get cavities anymore and instead get a free moonshine tap in your mouth. To understand how it works, I'll have to give you a quick intro into cavities and the bacteria that cause them. The majority of plaques and cavities are caused by the bacterium Streptococcus mutans. The S mutans lives in your mouth and digests any spare sugars that are left after chewing food. They create lactic acid as a waste product, which they excrete into the surroundings, i.e. your mouth. This lactic acid then reacts with the enamel on your teeth, causing it to break down and the continuous breakdown leads to cavities. This experiment uses mutated S mutans that has four mutations. The first and second are that it secretes antibiotics to kill competing oral bacteria as well as having an immunity to the same antibiotic. The third is that it changes the metabolic pathway so that the waste product created is alcohol rather than lactic acid. And finally, they modified it so that they can't arrange gene transfers with other bacteria so it can't pick up any harmful mutations from other oral bacteria. Now some nerds may argue that constantly producing alcohol in your mouth sounds dangerous, but I disagree. I'm very staunchly pro-choice when it comes to drink driving. I don't think that the far-reaching government should be allowed to pass laws dictating what we can do with our bodies. My drink, my choice. Maybe one day we can come together and defeat toxic soberlinity and the sobriarchy constantly oppressing us drink drivers. Jokes aside, this is actually pretty novel stuff and Lumina, the company that produces this strain, is allowing you to pre-order the product for around $250, which to potentially stop all cavities for the rest of your life seems like a huge bargain. Remember that the dental industry is worth $150 billion per year, with dental cavities costing around $30 billion per year. The only thing is that it's not, how do you say, FDA approved? as it's produced under the cosmetics label, specifically so that they didn't have to spend 10 years and a couple hundred million on clinical trials. They do have more than 100 people who have volunteered to take the treatment and they've fared pretty well from what I've read. It does also have the side effect of being able to potentially spread to young children who don't have fully matured oral microbiomes, but if you hate children and or are very pro-drunkenness, that may be a pro rather than a con. For clarity, I do have to add that the amount of alcohol produced is negligible and is still within the normal blood alcohol range, so unfortunately you can't use it to get wasted. What a shame. Anyway, our next human experiment to not try at home is performing your very own Russian sleep experiment. This experiment is actually pretty difficult to get down, so I created this handy two-step guide. Step 1. Don't sleep. Step 2. See Step 1. Now the effects can vary, but it usually goes like this. The first 24 hours, you are usually fine. Probably a little more irritable and less coordinated, but overall you're doing relatively well. 36 hours and you start microsleeping, which is where you'll sleep for around 30 seconds before jolting back awake. For the sake of the experiment, you're going to want to keep these to a minimum. And if you want, you can employ me as your personal wakefulness agent who, when you begin to microsleep, will slap you hard enough to get you back in the game. 48 hours in and you begin to hallucinate. 
Yeah, that demon in the corner isn't real, it's just a hallucination. Although, why am I able to see him? Oh shit, run. 72 hours in and the hallucinations begin to get even more weird and you may start to depersonalize, which is not good. 96 hours in and you begin to experience sleep deprivation psychosis, which, as you can see, is pretty funky. Most people by 96 hours can no longer physically keep themselves awake, even if they are being slapped. Trust me, I've tried. It's unclear how many days it takes for sleep deprivation to become fatal, but the longest any human has gone without sleep was around 11 days, although some people have died before reaching that point. Researchers at Harvard found that in sleep deprivation trials with flies, there is a large buildup of reactive oxygen species in the body, specifically the gut, which in high concentrations can lead to cell death. When they treated the flies with antioxidants, they found that the flies would live a normal lifespan, indicating that high concentrations of reactive oxygen species might be the mechanism of death in sleep deprivation. Now I'm no fly, or is that what I want you to believe? But I think that if you were to try this experiment, which you shouldn't, I'd suggest eating a lot of blueberries as they are antioxidant rich just in case. And that's why I'm pro-life for Berry Boy. The next DIY experiment to not try at home is tapeworm dieting. This one is pretty straightforward, do exactly what's on the tin. So we will be exploring the different species of tapeworm and judge them based on their effectiveness and their side effects. There are three tapeworms that we will be looking at and we're going to be putting them into a tier list. What's this? A tier list video? In a normal video? Has he gone mad? Maybe I have. What are you going to do about it, eh? <laughs> anyway, Diphilobothrium latum is our first tapeworm, also known as the fish tapeworm. And you can get it by, unsurprisingly, eating fish. They can grow up to 10 meters long and inhabit the intestine where they release up to 1 million tapeworm eggs every day as long as they remain untreated. That's a lot of child support for one tapeworm. Just know that I'd be a deadbeat dad if I had to live life as a tapeworm. Anyway, they cause B12 deficiency in humans which can lead to megaloblastic or pernicious anemia which, for the laymen, are just diseases affecting blood cell formation. Honestly, not too bad to be honest. Just take B12 supplements and you should be fine. For that reason, I'll put it in the OK tier. Our second tapeworm is Teenia saginata, or beef tapeworm. The largest known specimen grew to 22 meters and they can live up to 25 years in your small intestine rent free. Well, not for me. If I had this tapeworm, I'd be handing out eviction notices for missed rent payments faster than you can say rent moratorium. The infection starts off asymptomatic, but then symptoms like weight loss, constipation, diarrhea, nausea, and even loss of appetite, which for the sake of the experiment, sound pretty good. To have them eventually removed is actually really simple and only takes a single dose of praziquantel. This seems like a better choice than potentially having blood conditions, so for that reason, I'll put it in the best tier. Our final tapeworm is Teenia solium, or pork tapeworm. There are two methods of infection and the results vary quite heavily. The first is through ingestion of infected pork meat which will yield the normal intestinal tapeworms for the desired weight loss effect. The secondary infection type comes from ingesting the eggs from a food or water source that was contaminated by another human's feces that contain the eggs. The second type of infection can lead to the tapeworms growing in the lungs or even in the brain which can lead to dementia-like symptoms due to the formation of cysts that turn your brain into a block of cheese. You can treat the tapeworm once it's in your brain, but the holes will remain, so you basically get the brain of someone who has been huffing lead his whole life without the benefits of cheap fuel. Boomifying your brain to lose a couple kilograms of fat isn't worth it in my opinion, so it's going into the worst tier. That's all we have for the tapeworm mini tier list. Pretty good tier list in my opinion. Anyway, on to the last experiment. Our final human experiment to not try at home is self-infection with the infectious disease Toxoplasma gondii. Now there are multiple studies that go very in-depth on the negative effects and symptoms of the disease and why it's probably not a good idea to intentionally infect yourself. 
But that's a long and boring list. What we will be talking about though is the behavioural changes that you might experience if you are infected. In rats, it decreases their aversion to cat urine and cats in general to the point that they have no fear response in some cases. This is an intentional side effect caused by the disease so that it can infect its definitive host, that being the cats. Let me reiterate, the parasite that is only 5 to 50 micrometers in size has the ability to repress the transcription of genes in the part of the brain responsible for predator aversion. This is literally mind controlling rats to their death so that you can infect their predators. If you think that's wild, research into the relationship between T. gondii and humans and entrepreneurial behaviours found that those infected were 1.4 times more likely to study business and 1.8 times more likely to have started their own business. I'm starting to think that there may be a global conspiracy and it's this tiny little parasite that's controlling people into positions of power and influence so it can take over the world. Not only that, but it's been associated with neurological diseases such as schizophrenia. In a meta-analysis of 23 studies, they found that prevalence of antibodies to T. gondii was strongly correlated to having schizophrenia. How strongly correlated? Well, its odds ratio was 2.73, with a p-value of p is less than 0.00001, which means that the chance that the correlation was due to random chance is 0.0001%, which is pretty low. Now that sounds pretty great. Becoming a paranoid schizophrenic that has an unnatural urge to excel in finance and business. Real Sigma grind set shit right there. If you aren't T Gondi maxing, then can you really say you're on your trillionaire grind set? Probably not. Well, it may be a moot point because according to some serological studies, it found that close to 50% of the global population either has or has been exposed to T Gondi and may be chronically infected although it's most concentrated in Africa. IgG antibodies are also more prevalent amongst people who try to off themselves, particularly older women for some reason. They found that women over the age of 60 who had the disease were also more likely to commit unalive, with a p-value of 0.005 making it highly statistically significant. And this is all from just one parasite. Just imagine how many other parasites or microorganisms are exerting massive influence on our behaviours and we are all none the wiser. Again, I'm not advocating that any of you do this though, or any of the other human experiments explained in this video because… just because, okay? Anyway, that's all we have for today about DIY human experimentation. If you liked the video, consider liking and subscribing, but other than that, thanks for watching. Hope to see you in the next video. Bye.